Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to have let people uh, join for a few more minutes, but in the meantime, while we're waiting for uh, folks to log on, I just want to go through a few housekeeping items. Um, all of the registrants are on mute right now, except for the panelists. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, but if you want to submit questions before the end, if it occurs to you at any time during the presentation, uh, you can type in a question on, in the chat window that should be on the right side of your screen. If you don't see the chat window, uh, you may need to click on the little orange arrow that is probably in the top right of your screen and then the chat box will uh, appear and you can go ahead and type your question in and we'll be taking those at the end. Also we will we are recording the webinar so if you want to uh, look back at the information if you'd like to share it with someone else or uh, if you know somebody who missed the webinar and wanted to listen to it we'll have that up on our website it should be up uh, no later than Monday. We might still be able to get it up today, but it'll definitely be up on Monday. So, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about SSTI. For those maybe not familiar with SSTI, uh, you can find more information on us on our website, which is ssti.us. We are a network of reform-minded state DOTs. It was founded in 2010, and we are housed at the University of Wisconsin. And we work with state DOTs in three ways. We are a community of practice where Participating agencies can learn together and share experiences as they implement innovative transportation, smart transportation policies. And we usually get the executive level staff, uh, the head of the DOTs together once or twice a year in our community of practice meetings. And then we're also a source of direct technical assistance to agencies on transformative and replicable smart transportation reform efforts. And finally, we're a resource for the larger transportation community, including local, state, and federal agencies. And that's where these webinars come in, so that we can uh, get the information out to folks who are interested. Our speakers today, and these are actually in reverse order of who's going to be speaking. Uh, the first speaker is going to be Chris McCahill, who is a senior associate here at SSTI. Before he came to work with us, Chris worked on the project for transportation reform at the Congress for the New Urbanism in Chicago. Chris has worked on multimodal transportation projects around the country, and he's written extensively on issues related to urban transportation, land use, and the built environment for academic journals and the news media. He has a PhD in civil engineering from the University of Connecticut, and he worked with our second speaker while he was there. Our second speaker will be Norman Garrick. He's an associate professor of civil engineering at the University of Connecticut. He's a member of the National Board of the Congress for the New Urban Urbanism. He specializes in planning and design of urban transportation systems, especially as they relate to sustainability, placemaking, and urban re revitalization. His writing and research has been featured in many national publications, uh, too long to list, actually. Finally, we will be hearing from Stephen Cliff. He was appointed in July of 2014 by Governor Jerry Brown as the California Department of Transportation's Assistant Director of Sustainability, which was a newly created position at Caltrans um, to lead the agency's efforts in, the develop, in developing and implementing initiatives to align with California's goals on sustainability. 
Prior to working at Caltrans, Steve worked for the California Air Resources Board. And before that, he worked at UC Berkeley and at the Advanced Light Source at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which I don't know about, but it sounds very interesting, and I'd be curious to find out more about that. Um, Steve has a PhD in chemistry from the University of California, San Diego. And again, for those who might have been who might have joined us a little late, we're going to be taking questions at the end of the webinar. Go ahead and type in any questions you have in the chat box at any time during the presentation. And we will also be we also are recording the webinar so that it will be up on our website and you'll be able to access it later. And we'll also have the slides up as a separate file if uh, you just want to look at the slides. And with that, I am going to turn over the presentation to Chris McCahill, who will take it from here. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, let me see if I've got control. I do. All right. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, so I'm going to start off by just talking about uh, travel demand in the US, um, recent trends and forecasts. Uh, travel demand is something that we try and follow pretty closely here at SSTI, um, understand how it's changing at any given point in time, uh, what the factors are that are affecting that, um, and how states are responding, and what kind of forecasts of travel demand states are coming up with, and how changes are affecting those forecasts. So I'm just going to dig into that a bit here. Uh, for those of you who may not know exactly what we're talking about when we talk about changes in travel demand, uh, this just shows uh, trends in automobile use in the U.S. Uh, this graph shows going back to 1970. Um, and essentially what we're seeing is uh, what had been a, uh, a gradual increase um, <coughs> throughout most of the 20th century leveled off fairly recently. We see the amount of vehicle miles traveled per person in the U.S. Uh, reach its highest point in 2004. And that's decreased every year since. Um, total VMT continued to rise a little bit uh, due to population growth, uh, but that also peaked in 2007 um, and dropped a bit and has hovered uh, just below 3 trillion miles. Uh, there's been some positive effects of the recent decrease in VMT. Um, as you can see here, uh, CO2 emissions, which were rising uh, fairly steadily, um, dropped pretty drastically around the same time that we started to see VMT drop. Um, and that makes sense because it's basically a function of uh, how efficient fuel is burned and uh, how many miles are traveled. And you can see the number of miles traveled appear to have played a big role in that. Uh, we also see traffic fatalities, which were dropping um, somewhat uh, over the prior 20 years or so, um, drop off pretty significantly with that, with that decrease in miles. Uh, driving, driven, and that makes sense. <clears throat> uh, that's important um, because it's leading some, uh, it, it illustrates why some states are actually interested in VMT reduction goals. Uh, for example, in Massachusetts, they've set a statewide mode shift goal where they want to triple uh, biking, transit use, and walking by 2030. In a testimony to the, to the Massachusetts House Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change last year, they said, by investing in facilities and infrastructure that support greater travel choice, we can facilitate reduced VMT. MassDOT is working to make this happen, and the current environment is providing some excellent opportunities in this area. And what they're talking about is this, this recent decrease in travel demand on highways that we're seeing um, provides an opportunity to sort of uh, rethink investing in major uh, capacity expansions and maybe shifting investments toward um, alternative modes. Uh, on the opposite side, we're seeing some negative consequences of the degree, decrease in VMT, uh, namely that um, <clears throat> we're not collecting the gas taxes that we used to collect. Um, those have increased significantly ever since we started to see VMT drop off, um, even though spending has uh, increased pretty regularly each year. Um, so that means that the Federal Highway Trust Fund has um, come close to bottoming out um, every year for the past few years, and that's even with some injections of money from the general fund. Uh, and this is something that states are dealing with, um, as well as the federal government, and um, trying to grasp how they're going to fill uh, the missing, the makeup for the missing funds. 
So what's affecting this uh, change in VMT? Well, we know what drove VMT up for many years. Um, we had a growing population. We had a growing workforce, mainly with women entering the workforce, uh, rising incomes, rising automobile ownership, and urban sprawl, where things were becoming more spread out, and so people were driving longer distances. We've got many factors that are now leading to this change, uh, this recent change in driving. Um, among those, traffic congestion is at um, its worst it ever has been. Uh, people are dr driving about as long as they're willing to to work. Costs are going up. Um, young people are driving less. We're seeing new development patterns, uh, more transit, biking, and walking, and the effects of technology. Um, and that's kind of a mixed bag of effects. I don't want to dwell on this too much because I know Norman Garrick is going to go into this a bit in uh, this next part of this webinar. What I do want to talk about is what uh, appears to be going on right now. Um, so we've been waiting for the uh, Federal Highway Administration to release uh, VMT numbers for uh, total numbers for the year of 2014. They usually come out about right now. Uh, we just learned that they all they should be released later next week. Uh, in the meantime, we've been looking at what's happened so far in 2014, and we see that per capita VMT has increased uh, just about every month since April. So we are expecting that um, this could be the first annual increase in uh, per capita VMT in a decade. Um, so obviously this is going to lead to questions such as, um, now that uh, maybe the economy is approving, are we actually going to see a return to what's been called normal? Uh, and what we think is that if that's true in any way, uh, it's certainly a return to a new normal. Um, and I'll explain why that is some. Uh, so what are some of the factors that might lead to this, this recent uh, increase in driving? Well, fuel prices dropped. Um, we saw a really drastic drop in the last quarter of 2014. Uh, overall, we saw a 4% decrease from the previous year. Um, and that will certainly have some effects on driving. Um, but if you look through the literature um, a bit, uh, it's pretty clear that the effects of fuel prices on driving have, have uh, weakened quite a bit uh, over the last several decades. Um, in the 1990s, the effects of gas price was about two to four times stronger than it is now. Um, so uh, currently with the 4% decrease, you know, the effects of BMT, we might see increases on the order of uh, a fraction of a percent. Um, so some effects, but quite small. We're also seeing employment on the rise. Um, and this is uh, this has lagged a bit behind the economic recovery, um, but employment has been increasing uh, over the past few years, um, and this will likely continue. Um, and this could potentially drive up total VMT in the U.S. But we can also look more broadly at economic growth, um, and this is an interesting one because for a long time it's been sort of a catch-all of all these different effects. Uh, throughout most of the 20th century, we saw VMT and gross domestic product in the U.S. Uh, increase pretty much in sync. Um, you may be aware that sometime over the last several decades, um, these two started to uncouple from each other, uh, and the growth in BMT started to drop a bit below economic growth. Um, so they weren't growing in unison anymore. Um, we wanted to take a look at that and kind of illustrate that. So we looked, uh, going back to 1970, at the total number of vehicle miles traveled per $1,000 of GDP. Um, and I think this paints a pretty clear picture of, of how that change has played out. Um, up until the mid to or early to mid-1990s, you see the number of miles traveled per dollar GDP actually increasing more or less each year. So that in 1970, uh, we drove about 170 miles per $1,000 of GDP, and that increased to more than 200 miles um, by the early 1990s. Uh, since then, however, we've been driving fewer and fewer miles for each dollar of gross domestic product. Um, this is uh, partly because of the changing um, nature of the economy, of course, um, but it also has to do with some of these factors that I mentioned earlier and that, that Norman's going to dig into a bit more. Uh, so what the impact of this shift on uh, VMT growth is, to understand that a bit, um, and understand how these past relationships no longer hold, how that affects VMT growth. 
uh, we modeled VMT using G GDP. Uh, this is a really simple uh, linear regression model just to illustrate the point. Um, we were actually able to predict up until 1995, we're able to estimate VMT growth um, just by looking at GDP. GDP explains about more than 95% variation in uh, VMT up until that point. Of course, the rest of the variation is due to things like uh, employment and gas prices and housing starts and things like that. But we get a pretty good sense of uh, where VMT is headed. However, if we use that model to try and forecast past 1995, uh, what we see is that it, it grossly overestimates what, we, what actually happened, right? So this is just showing, illustrating that, that decoupling of uh, VMT from GDP. Using that, that model that used to hold, um, we actually see that per capita VD, VMP, VMT dropped about 2,500 fewer miles than we would have expected. Um, we played around with this model a little bit and saw that GDP can still kind of, we can, we can sort of bend this forecast downward and it still explains a good amount of the variation in VMT, except that they're growing further and further apart. So they're growing, so if we just assume that the average person is driving about 100 miles uh, or so less per year, uh, we still see that the two track closely, but the gap is getting wider and wider. Um, and we expect to see that continue. Um, in fact, as Norman's going to go into, the, the, you'll see that the, the relationship between VMT and GDP might be changing much more drastically than we think. So what, how are states respond to, responding to this? Um, and it's been kind of a slow process to understand uh, what the implications are for DOTs um, and, and for DOTs to understand um, how they should be reacting. But we've been looking at, uh, at how they're changing some of their forecasts. And this is from the Colorado State Transportation Plan. Um, and basically what they did recently was forecast no growth in uh, per capita VMT. Uh, I think this is an interesting approach because it sort of suggests, it, it highlights the uncertainty in where VMT is headed. And I think it, should, it provides a baseline um, uh, where you can kind of uh, imagine how, how decisions you're making might even affect a slight shift upward or a slight shift downward. Um, but other than that, we don't really know where things are headed. Um, another interesting forecast comes from uh, the Washington State DOT. They've actually been revising their forecasts every year uh, since 2010. Um, and it's been, you can see that they change their forecast quite a bit from year to year. Uh, but in 2013, they were still forecasting uh, a moderate growth in, in uh, VMT, total VMT, up through 2040. Um, this past September, September 2014, they revised their forecast downward uh, even more so that they're now expecting um, VMT, total VMT to, to level off and start to decrease. Uh, and of course, um, we've also been tracking uh, what USDOT has been forecasting in growth and travel demand for a while. Um, and we've been looking at the uh, conditions and performance report that they produce every every uh, two years for Congress. Um, and for a long time, uh, as this graph shows, uh, they're basically estimating the same growth each year, uh, even as VMT started to level off. And at a certain, at a certain point, uh, this started to look like something was off, obviously. Um, in 2014, they finally released a second alternative growth rate. So they reduced, they included their, their typical growth rate of about 1.9% VMT per year. Uh, and they included a revised downward estimate of 1.4% growth per year. Well, in May 2014, uh, they released a report that was actually their first internal assessment of uh, future VMT growth um, based on demographic trends, population growth, um, aging of the, aging of the uh, population, and factors like that. And that's the red line that you see here. Um, and in this case, they're, they revised their growth rate down to 1% per year through 2032 and uh, down to 0.75% through 2042. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, whether this plays out in the new conditions and performance report um, and uh, where, what other states choose to do in their forecasts. Uh, one alternative to, could be to, to switch to more of a scenario planning type forecast. Um, we've highlighted in our, in our uh, newsletter 
a uh, NCHRP report 750 uh, in which the, the researchers tested four different growth scenarios, uh, including technological innovations, um, collapse of the economy, um, a scenario where we um, <coughs> do uh, everything we can to, to minimize our environmental impacts. And they found that, that BMT growth could vary by as much as 6% upward or 50% uh, downward. Um, so taking an approach like this could, might, could help uh, DOTs understand um, possibilities in the future and, and take a more scenario planning type approach. Um, so that's all I want to go into. Uh, and I think uh, I'll turn it over to Norman. OK, great. I'm going to go ahead and give control over to Norman. And uh, you should be able to click on the slides and go ahead and change those. OK, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be talking about this subject. I've been fascinated with this subject for quite a while. Um, I've been following this trend in the US over the last, well, I guess I'm going ahead of my, getting ahead of myself. This trend in the U.S. since 19 well, I haven't been following it since 1908, but I've been following what the trend looked like since 1908 um, to see how VMT has changed um, in, in in those years, and it's really nice to be in a group of people that are also as interested in this subject because I think it's so much about our cities and what we do in terms of transportation planning, it's really important to understand these changes going backwards and forwards in, in history. So um, in 2010, I actually wrote an article talking about the possibility that we were entering a new era in transportation. And the thing that uh, motivated me to write this was not just the fact that BMT had been going down, but also changes that were happening in cities around the country, in Portland, Oregon, where they have a very ambitious bike plan, and it, the Broadway um, closing was also an inspiration. Um, this got a lot of really interesting um, pushback on the net. Um, well, let me leave it at that. Very interesting um, pushback. So um, to go back to this map of how we've been traveling in the U.S., one of the things that fascinates me about it is how you can see big policy and big economic decisions written on it. For example, we see the start of the curve. I'm having a problem here. Is there anything going? Okay, there we go. So the start of the curve, of course, was um, the 1908 with the uh, Model T coming out. We see the Great Depression barely register as a downturn, almost nothing. Um, but World War II was a massive, as um, it is the only time that we have seen a downturn that is like what we're seeing now. But as you notice, after the war, it just resumed at a, at a faster pace um, and was aided by things such as the Housing Act in 1949, the Highway Bill in 1956, and we continued like that until the first oil crisis in 1973 and the second oil crisis in 1979. So now we are what seems to be a peak, a different era. And that's where, that's what this presentation is about. So one of the things we have been trying to understand in my group is what are some of the factors that affect travel behavior, and in particular, BMT per capita. And we have started out by trying to come up with a conceptual, a comprehensive conceptual model of what is going on. And these are some of the issues that we are looking at the policies implemented both at the federal, state, and municipal level, socioeconomic factors, how we are rolling out the transportation system and um, where we are putting our monies, um, the built environment, Chris talked about some of those issues, and finally, some technological issues, including techn technology that is making it easier to share uh, transportation, to use uh, 
different modes of transit, etc. So this is the starting point for our research, and we have been trying to understand how to characterize this from a, a research point of view. And this is um, is the very complex um, matrix of of factors that we're looking at to try to put into statistical models to better understand what is going on. So, um, so if we go back and focus on what has been going on in the U.S. from 1980 to now, we see the the um, the, the, the decrease in um, per capita VMT starting in 2004. But one of the interesting things is we tend to talk about what's happening in America. But the experiences in different places in America are, are all very different. So for example, we look at the case of Massachusetts where the per capita VMT today is about 20% um, lower than the US average. Compare that to uh, Mississippi, which is almost twice that in Massachusetts. And you see a big signal from the, um, the Great Recession in a place like Mississippi compared to North Dakota, which is in a, or has been in a rather difficult, different economy than other places in the country over the last four or five years, um, compared to Nevada. So this, um, in our research, led us to the idea that what we need to be doing is to focus not so much on the U.S. numbers, but to look at the individual states. because. As you all know, what we have are 50 states with 50 very different experiences. And in essence, we have 50 experiments going on, different policies, different funding, different land use planning. So trying to understand from those 50 experiments, what are some of the factors that have led to the changes that we're seeing? So one of the things we started doing at first is to understand when peak travel occurred. And this was a surprise. This is what we found. Uh, we found that this peaking phenomena goes back to at least till 1992 when the first state showed a peak. The first state was Washington State in 1992. So um, this is a map of the, the country showing most of the country had, it had, was still growing their GDP. Washington State had peaked. By 1999, we see that six states and the District, seven states and the District of Columbia had peaked. So we were really, really surprised to discover how long, long lasting this phenomenon of uh, peak travel was at the state level. By 2004, more than half of the states had peaked. And by 2011, only two states, North Dakota and Alabama, had not gotten, had not shown a peak. Um, and to illustrate um, the state, the case of Washington, the changes that we're seeing are quite substantial. We're seeing a, about a 30% decrease in per capita travel between 1992 and now. And you can also see that much of that change has come since the last, I would say, last um, um, 10 years or so. So the, uh, um, a second part of this research that we've been looking at is the relationship between driving and the economy. Last year we wrote a paper, a Transportation Research Board paper, looking at the literature that has dealt with this phenomenon of um, the, the tie between driving and the economy and the idea that there's this, this decoupling, as Chris has mentioned in, in his um, presentation. So one of the things we wanted to look at in a very simple way was what has been the experience of the different states. Um, and in our minds, we have this idea that VMT increases with GDP. So what we wanted to do was to look at the experience in the different states by decade. So we looked at um, all 50 states in three decades for which we have data at the state level. And we found, for example, in Connecticut that as 
is the um, the stereotype that GDP increased with VMT in the decade of the of the 80s, similarly in the decade of the 90s, but that by the noughts this relationship had broken down, and so um, you know we don't really have a good handle as to why this has happened, but it's something that we're seeing in many states. So overall, what we're finding is that in the 80s, we found that there was a positive correlation between driving and the economy in 39 states. There was a negative correlation in five states. And in six states, we found no significant relationship. Moving on to the 90s, we found the states with positive correlation had increased to 46. Um, one state with a negative correlation, and three states not with no significant correlation. So this is about when Chris um, showed that there was a change in the curve between G GDP and VMT. Moving on to the nodes, at the state level, we find that there's still 15 states way down from before, just 15 states with a positive correlation between driving and the e economy, five with a negative correlation, and um, 30 with no significant correlation. So this is a real change, and this is something that really needs more attention and more research to really understand what is going on. But it's an implication that all you know, a lot of what we have built our transportation policies on needs to be re rethought. Um, one of the interesting things about this graph also is that the five states that showed a negative correlation were, were Washington, Oregon, uh, Kentucky, Utah, and Alaska. And all of these were states that showed an early peak, um, mostly before um, all before 2003. In contrast, this 15 states that are still showing a positive correlation, we're beginning to call the behind the curve states. Um, 11 of those peaked after 2004, and two, Alabama and North Dakota, have not peaked yet. So there is an interesting correlation going on here. The full implications is not yet clear as to what is going on. So one of the things we have also looked at for each state, Chris um, graphed miles driven per uh, dollar per dollar of GDP. We actually look at this somewhat differently. We looked at dollars of GDP for each mile driven. So the opposite of the graph that Chris is showing. And to illustrate the numbers for uh, the United States, it's about five. It's been relatively stable, but you can see that um, that switch in direction that, that Chris talked about, that it was going down in our case and then started going up. In his case, you had a peak and then it started going down around 1995. But then we see places like um, Alabama, which is falling further and further behind the national average, in comparison, so we see a state like Washington, D.C. I'm sorry, a state like Washington, which is outpacing the U.S. and seems to be moving far, further ahead. So what is going on is that the amount of dollars earned keeps increasing for each mile driven as we go from year to year. And there might be many factors contributing to this, but of course we can think of something um, as simple as the fact that Washington is spending less money and on importing gasoline um, for each uh, dollar of, of, of production. And this is seemingly having a very uh, beneficial effect on the state economy. Um, Utah this shows some similar patterns. Um, um, and interestingly, compared to its neighbor, New Mexico, uh, divergence between those two states. So the question is, are we entering a new era? Um, 
Well, the, the research would seem to indicate this because what we're seeing is that this pattern of travel peaking is really a two-decade long phenomenon at the state level. But what we're seeing now also is that it's widespread. We're seeing peaks still in almost all of the states in the U.S. So it would seem that we can safely say that we are entering a new era in terms of the relationship between travel and the economy. So one of the things that is always uh, the next question then is what is the primary cause of, of peak travel? And um, a lot of people point to specific um, one or two ideas. One of the ones that often come up is this issue of smartphones. Um, we would like to point out that in our research, peaking in a lot of the states happened long before the smartphones came about. Um, the first iPhone was released in 2007, so that does not seem to be the only cause. It certainly has accelerated the trend, but it's certainly not the only cause of what we're seeing. Similarly, um, this issue of the impact of the Great Recession, and again, a lot of the, the uh, peaking occurred before 2004, long before the recession. So uh, this phenomenon of, of um, states peaking, we have to look somewhere else and not just at this big decrease in the economy in 2008. Um, so going back to this issue of all the factors affecting the GDP, uh, one of the things that we we have started looking at is a model that will try to understand the changes at the statewide level um, based on this conceptual model. Uh, we're still struggling with the data. This is very difficult data to get at. But there seems to be two very important things that we are seeing in our data. One is a move back to the city. So we are seeing a densification in a lot of states that seems to correlate with changes in VMT. But the second thing, and I think it doesn't get talked about as much, is that we're seeing cities acting more like cities. In other words, we're seeing places that are beginning to facilitate more travel by transit, by walking, by biking, etc. So it's, a com it's not just a combination of moving back to the cities, but it's also how we're changing the cities and um, getting them to function more like they did prior to the 1970s to the 1960s, etc. The other point from our research that we want to emphasize is that increased driving no longer seems to correlate to increased wealth. And um, I'm highlighting these three states because we know that these states, Washington, Oregon, and Utah, have over the last 10, 15, 20 years have implemented policies that support smart growth, that supports densification, that supports the um, increased use of transit. And we can see the impact on the, I would say, the driving productivity, the amount of dollars of GDP per, uh, per miles traveled. So the evidence and this is evidence that we're still building, but the evidence suggests that instead of increase in driving correlated with increased wealth, we're seeing that increase in wealth is actually occurring as states have decreased their level of driving. So what's at stake? Uh, I think Rock Miller, the IT president, put it very well in 2012 when he said that when he asked, will VMT continue its slight downward trend or will it turn upwards and rejoin the economic activity trends? So he's really asking the question, and he points out that a lot depends on this. If we're going to make proper recommendations about future decisions, we need to understand these trends, and we need to be on, um, answering these questions. So based on our research, this is what I would say. 
It seems unlikely. It seems likely that a VMT decrease is, is going to continue. Um, the fact that it's been so ongoing in so many states, it, it's, it seems to such support the idea that it will continue. But I should also point out that these states have, a lot of the states that we have highlighted have made policy changes that supports the decrease in um, VMT. Secondly, these places are seeing positive economic outcomes related to decrease in driving. So, so, um, so the last point is that we really need a different approach. I think that's what um, Chris will be, um, uh, Steve will be talking about in the last section, is this idea of states focusing on VMT reduction. And one of the interesting things for us is that VMT reduction in many places is seen as about being about the environment. But in our research, it seems like there's also a economic good to trying to reduce um, VM VMT at the state level. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, before we go on to Steve, I do want to remind people that uh, we will be qu taking questions at the end. And you can uh, type in any questions that you have in the chat box, which should appear on um, the right side of your screen. So um, Steve, I have given you control. And you can go ahead and uh, um, Take control. Thanks, Robbie, and uh, thanks, Chris and Norman, for your presentations. Um, that's it's a great setup for what I'm going to talk about today. I think I have control here. You need to click on the slide. Just there, you go, and then you can advance one more to get to yours. There you go. Got it. Great. Thank you. So. Um, I'm going to jump right in. I know we are um, want to have, leave plenty of time for questions. So I wanted to just give a sense of the political landscape here in California. Uh, as Norman mentioned, uh, largely VMT reductions have been associated with policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that's definitely true in California, but I'm really encouraged to see that the trend towards reduced VMT is associated with increased economic growth. And, uh, you know, I take that to mean that the more we reduce VMT through these various policies, the more prosperous we'll be. And so I think that's a great setup for the sustainability framework that we're uh, putting in place here in California. But just talking a little bit about the political landscape, in California we have a number of laws. This is Assembly Bill and, and uh, Senate Bill, the AB and SB, uh, a number of laws that are associated with reduction of VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, starting back uh, in 2006 with AB 32, the so-called Global Warming Solutions Act, it mandates reductions of greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020 and to continue those reductions beyond. And currently there's very active discussions in this legislative session about 2030 and 2050 targets, so extending those targets well beyond the what uh, um, the mandates that had already been put in place for 2020. Uh, more recently, in 2008, we had SB 375, which is the Sustainable Communities Act, and it mandates that regional greenhouse gas emissions targets would be adopted by the California Air Resources Board, and then development of sustainable community strategies would be put in place to help achieve those targets. So each of the uh, planning uh, regions here in California had to put in place these sustainable community strategies, and that would uh, focus on um, VMT reduction to achieve greenhouse gas emissions reduction. Uh, they couldn't take credit for technology changes and things like that. It really had to be about shifts in uh, land use to support VMT reduction. More, more recently than that, in 2009, SB 391 mandated that Caltrans develop a California transportation plan and update it every five years. And the primary goal that was uh, listed in, the, in this law was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050. So Caltrans is actually doing the first one of those plans this year. And BMT reduction is a, a central focus of that, of course. In order to achieve those greenhouse gas emission reductions, you have to do much more than just BMT. You also have to do um, uh, rely on technological shifts as well. Um, 
And then uh, this last session, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, two years ago, Senate Bill 743 was put in place. And this was to change the framework for transportation analysis from what was called level of service to a VMT-based uh, analysis. Uh, the idea being that we wanted to get away from looking at transportation impacts from an auto mobility perspective and um, turn that to how do we move people more efficiently. And so more focusing on VMT, VMT per capita, rather than sort of auto mobility is the new framework that we're putting in place. And so going forward, that will be the standard for transportation analyses here in California. And then uh, lastly, I want to talk about SB 1077. This is um, uh, basically to put in place uh, evaluation of alternatives to a motor vehicle fuel tax and uh, development of a road charge pilot program. And um, as well, there's active discussions about new funds for transportation in California for maintenance and infrastructure development. Um, the reason I bring this up is that, of course, as gas use goes down, of course, so does funding. And so that can impact our transportation infrastructure. We want to make sure that we have a sustainable source of funding. So as, as Chris and Norman laid out uh, very well, I think, the we're really at a point now in transportation where things have shifted quite dramatically. Funding is declining. Millennials don't want to drive. New urbanism, that is moving back into cities, is in vogue. And overall driving seems to be going down. And I put a question mark there, uh, as did Chris, um, since we're still kind of waiting for some of the, the latest numbers. And so recognizing that there's this shift occurring in the market, and that shift coincides with what we want to see, which is reduced emissions, reduced VMT, we can actually help respond to our market and nudge it a little bit. So through a series of policies, we can continue that trend. So what do we want? We want to develop a transportation system that's accessible, multimodal, creates vibrant, livable communities, improves health, is aligned with our environmental goals, and increases wealth. So it's all those things that I laid out in the various statutes that we put in place. And it's very consistent with what we know now from the research. As Norman indicated, the more you drive down DMT, the wealthier we get. So that's a fantastic outcome. And I'm really, really pleased to see that, that the, the data and research support that conclusion. So at Caltrans, what we've been doing is really evaluating how do we operate as a Department of Transportation. And over the last several months, we've been working to put in place a new mission and vision for the department. And comes with that a set of goals that I'll describe here in a minute. Our new mission is to provide a safe, sustainable, integrated, and efficient transportation system to enhance California's economy and livability. So this describes what we do and why we do it. The goals that we put in place include safety and health, stewardship and efficiency, sustainability, livability, and economy, system performance, and organizational excellence. We want to have a safe system that allows people to get where they need to go. We want to do so in a way that supports our communities and allows people, uh, all people, to be able to get where they need to go, and that, that generally is consistent with our environmental goals. And in order to do that, the great thing is, again, as we reduce VMT, we reduce emissions, and we improve the economy. And we can create communities that are more livable as a result. So what we've, what we've tried to do, I'm actually going to um, try and move through these really quickly, because I know we want to get to questions. We uh, defined what that sustainability, livability, and economy goal looks like. And we defined it as make long-lasting, smart mobility decisions that improve the environment, support a vibrant economy, and build communities, not sprawl. And with that came a series of objectives that we were trying to achieve. So we focused sustainability around these three things, people, planet, and prosperity. To improve the quality of life for all Californians by providing choice and alternatives to single occupant car trips. We know that single occupant car trips are one of the least efficient ways to get people around and are a drag on our economy. So we want to, we want to support choice and alternatives. We want to increase accessibility to all modes of transportation and create transportation corridors not only for conveyance of people, goods, and services, but also as livable public spaces. 
We need to reduce environmental impacts from the transportation system, and we need to do so in a way that supports this statewide goal of reducing emissions dramatically by mid-century to stabilize climate. And lastly, we want to improve the economic prosperity of the state and local communities through a resilient and integrated transportation system. So how are we going to do that? We have a number of things that we're, we're trying to uh, put in place to measure our progress towards this goal. And so I've highlighted a few here. This is, this is actually uh, under active development here at Caltrans, and it's uh, consistent with our, our policy goals. We're trying to put forth the strategic plan, which will set out the policies that our department will adhere to as we go forward. Now, the measures include per capita VMT, what we've been talking about today. And we want to set a really aggressive reduction goal, something on the order of 10 to 15 percent by 2020 is, is what we're looking at. We want to reduce highway-related GHG and air criteria pollutant emissions with a reduction goal of something like 15 percent. Uh, for GHG and about 50% for criteria pollutants by 2020. We want to increase non-auto mode share, that is bike, pedestrian, and transit mode share, similar to what uh, Massachusetts uh, put in place. They have a 2030 goal of tripling each of those. We're looking at something very similar. We have near-term goals uh, 2020, and we'll be thinking about more long-term goals as well, but something very consistent with that double and tripling the uh, non-auto mode share as we go forward. And then we want to develop things like accessibility scores, livability scores, and resiliency scores to help us better prioritize our transportation investment. As dollars go down, we need to really prioritize our transportation investments carefully. And we also need to make the case that investing in transportation in a way that reduces VMT can help enhance our economy. And so we want to be able to have performance measures in place that can really show what you get for your dollar when you're spending it on transportation infrastructure. So the strategies that we would put in place to help achieve some of these, these broader goals would be better connectivity for bike, pedestrian, and transit. And this includes a, a new project that, that California is undertaking that many of you may have heard about is the high-speed rail system. This would connect the Central Valley of California uh, and Northern California to, to Los Angeles. Right now, the only alternatives for trying to get between these various regions is really to either drive or to get on a plane. Air travel is not very equitable, and driving provides a host of, uh, of problems, including safety and greenhouse gas disbenefits. So having this, this high-speed rail system will actually help us uh, better connect the state, improve the economy, and do so in a way that helps us to reduce VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. Other strategies, of course, for reducing GHG would include things like zero emission vehicles and green fleets. To reduce, to reduce VMT and greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at demand management and putting in place policies for managed lanes, uh, and improving safety for all modes. I read a report recently which showed that 43% of all pedestrian fatalities occur in just four states in the U.S., and those four states only make up about 33% of the population. California is one of those states. So we really need to increase, increase safety for all modes so we can get people out of their cars so that these other modes are just as safe and pleasurable to get between point A and point B. We want to put in place a better planning through project delivery type of an approach where we really think about what our long-term goals are for the transportation system, do our detailed analysis for how we would uh, put in place a system that achieves those goals, and then carry that through all the way to project delivery, such that we have a, a, a transportation system which is much more focused on uh, decreasing BMT, um, uh, reducing emissions, increasing productivity, livability, accessibility, um, but uh, does so in a way that uh, keeps those goals in mind when projects are delivered and reduces the possibility of capacity expansion as a, as a primary way to, to, to move uh, people more quickly. We have a smart mobility framework, which is a, a planning framework that we've that we put in place and we're, uh, we've run a few pilot programs now using the smart mobility framework as a way to really dig into planning at 
uh, anything from the neighborhood scale all the way up to the corridor or even statewide scale. And so this, uh, this framework focuses on using performance measures, carefully selecting those performance measures, and then measuring the outcome of the uh, results of planning to project delivery, uh, and then using that to feed back into our system so that we can help better plan uh, the transportation system as we go forward. And a host of other things, including complete streets and um, better uh, wildlife habitat, biodiversity, and connectivity of systems, uh, a focus on freight, more efficient freight and zero emission freight corridors, and increasing the resiliency of the system. So this would be to ensure that we've got adaptation for climate change and to ensure that we have um, a system that we can afford going forward. And within that, the, the road charge evaluation and pilot project development is underway. As I mentioned, that's required by statute and that, that project is well underway here in California. So with that, I'm going to uh, close uh, with just some contacts here. And so folks that have access to this presentation after the fact are, are welcome to uh, follow us on Twitter. And we're putting together a new blog and website. Uh, or uh, here's a couple of contacts if you have questions as follow-up. We'd be, we'd be glad to do that. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'm going to let Chris read the questions. Uh, I think, Chris, you have access to the questions there, right? I do. OK. Uh, our first, first question I see here is a pretty straightforward one. Just wondering if the VMT versus uh, GDP graph uh, accounted for inflation rate. Um, my VMT figures, the VMT per GDP, and the regression model uh, did. They were all set to $2014. Yes, uh, us also. Um, so yeah, the, that's why our figures were quite well. Was the inverse of yours? Um, also, a question here. I think for Cliff, or for Steve. Um, uh, so as as uh, as you're setting this, uh, v, as you have a, your sights on a VMT reduction goal, obviously you're working against. Um, the state having money for transportation. Um, so how, how do you tackle both of these at the same time and make up and your, your vision for uh, achieving everything you want to as EMT goes down? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think it, it, it's, the, the answer is complicated, but it, basically we have, um, you know, we're evaluating ways to, to fund transportation that don't rely specifically on the motor vehicle fuel tax. Um, we also have, a, in California, um, our model for funding transportation is uh, different than a lot of areas where we have uh, sales tax measures that, that support transportation infrastructure that many of the counties have put in place or the local regions have put in place. There's 20, I think 20 counties in California that have sales tax measures for transportation in, uh, infrastructure investment. So money does come from other than motor vehicle fuel tax for transportation in California. I think going forward, we're going to need to evaluate various ways to, to continue the funding and to ensure that we have appropriate funding for maintenance as, as we, you know, maintenance and operation of the system as we go forward. But, uh, you know, that, that aside, we know that the benefits of reducing VMT are so great that we need to worry about the, the financial challenge associated with that, um, but it's not a significant enough challenge that it would keep us from wanting to undertake these policies. We know that economic growth and uh, more livability and accessibility and better equity for all users of the transportation system result from reducing VMT. So that's really our primary focus. Uh, great. Um, Another question here about, um, we're seeing large scale uh, sort of aggregate decreases in VMT, um, and yet still uh, on, on the project level, um, a lot of forecasts still showing uh, growth in VMT. This is, I know this is happening all over the country, um, and what's going on there. Um, I think I'll, I'll try and speak to that a bit. In, uh, and it's really hard to sort out, as you can see, once we start to parse out national data into state level data, we start to see the effects, the BMT changes uh, varying quite a bit. The same is true at the project level where 
a certain region might be experiencing growth, um, in, in which case, um, you know, any sort of road expansion project that you put in is, is probably going to uh, collect a lot of the traffic in the region and you'll see traffic volumes go up. Um, but we've looked at, at this trend um, on some projects and you see the same is true of if you reduce your capacity, the volumes go down. Um, and it really becomes a matter of pri prioritizing your investment and, and aligning them with your goals. So uh, if you want to see mode shift, um, then it's worth investing in, in uh, uh, other infrastructure regardless of what the, the models are showing. I don't know if anybody has something to add there. Um, if not, I see another question here. Um, it says, uh, California must have uh, small and rural towns upstate uh, from larger cities. Um, so how is land use planning uh, being administered? Um, is it, if it's the purview of local municipalities, how do you reach out to them to encourage smart growth and transit? Yeah, that's definitely the conundrum here in California. Uh, land use planning is is done by local municipalities. I think SB 375 was a, a good framework for starting that discussion. And I think the state needs to do more in their leadership to, to focus um, you know, more on the benefits of smart land use planning. I guess what I would say is that you know, the way I think we've, we're looking at this at the state level is we want to set out what we think that vision should be, and that can't just be our vision here from the state capitol. We need to be thinking about that and working with the locals. And so that's really critical to do that. But once we've come up with that vision, then we need to put in place the right kinds of policies to make sure that we're achieving that. So a lot of times what happens is if, if uh, you know, a local area has a particular priority, it may be very consistent with the statewide priority, but could be implemented in a way that's really inconsistent. And so, you know, for example, if in the Central Valley we value agricultural land, then we should be putting in place policies that help to maintain that agricultural land, and we should, you know, determine what the best way to do that is. Uh, and, you know, I think that it, part of the challenge here is just really expressing what it is we're trying to achieve and coming up with a vision for that. And in part, that I think is the role of the state, but it has to be done in coordination with local. Yeah, um, I can add to that a little bit um, because we actually at SSTI um, wrote an article on this topic last week. Um, so uh, the Vermont Agency for Transportation um, just started a new grant program where they're funding local projects aimed specifically at um, coordinating transportation and land use decisions. Um, and they're awarding about $200,000 a year for those types of programs just to tr try and um, support local communities that are making these, uh, these decisions. Um, also at Tennessee DOT, they have a pretty um, strong community planning division um, whose mission is to actually sort of be on the ground throughout the state. Um, they have planners designated for different regions working closely with the communities um, to try and get ahead of land use decisions that might ultimately cost Tennessee DOT down the road. So for example, um, sprawl growth patterns that um, amplify transportation costs or um, communities that are locating new schools on the, on the edges of town which will later cost uh, DOT uh, in transportation programs ahead of time. So they're not trying to force anything upon the local communities but work with them um, to make smarter decisions in advance. Chris, um, maybe I can just add quickly, um, I really appreciate you saying that. I, uh, here in California, we have uh, similar policies. Caltrans is broken up into 12 districts, and so each of our districts will work with their local partners. We also administer uh, sustainable community planning grants, and a very significant amount of money goes towards uh, planning efforts for sustainable communities, uh, including this kind of you know smart growth uh, sorts of approaches. I mentioned the smart mobility framework, so that's something that we're trying to put in place to help communities focus on uh, the type of sustainable community planning that really helps uh, reduce VMT and improve land use and uh, increase value of, of uh, land use through planning. Um, and as well, there's actually a lot of money through the uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is the result of 
uh, money that comes from the, the cap and trade auctions from our from the California Greenhouse Gas Cap and Trade Program to help support infrastructure development for communities for better planning, transit, uh, and then we also have a, an active transportation program where communities can um, uh, get money for active transportation projects. So this would be for bike and ped infrastructure. I'd just like to add that there's another side to, to the, this issue. Um, in many cases, you have cities and towns wanting to do what they think is the right thing, but the, um, they are pre prevented or hampered by state policies, such as um, policies relating to street design, etc. Uh, so we're we're we've pushed uh, over an hour a bit. Um, I don't see any questions right now. If anybody wants to throw one in at the last minute, I'm sure we can take one. Um, and uh, I will throw it over to Robbie. I don't know if you've had any questions pop in. Um, I don't see any. Uh, if if you haven't figured out how to ask a question, uh, there is a chat box on your screen. If you don't see it, you may need to uh, pull the little orange arrow that's in the upper right-hand corner. Um, I appreciate people sticking around. Uh, people have been very good about hanging in there. And I just want to, while we're seeing if there's any further questions, any last-minute questions, I just want to remind people that we will have a recording up on the SSTI website. It does say tomorrow, but since today is Friday, it will probably be up on Monday, um, although we might still get it up today. Uh, and we do have webinars almost every month. And if you would like to be informed of future webinars or if you're interested in our work in general, um, make sure to subscribe to the SSTI newsletter, which comes out every two weeks. You can also follow us on Twitter, and you can do both of those things on our website, which is SSTI.us. And I, you can also find our past webinars, articles, and some resources on there as well. And I very much appreciate both of our, all three of our presenters um, giving us their time and knowledge. I think it was an extremely interesting discussion. And um, I, I think it will continue. This is an ongoing topic. And uh, we will see how the trends and the policies emerge. So um, thank you all very much. And thank you all for signing on to uh, listen to the webinar.